Hello everybody, Jazz's online editor Matt Mikuchi here welcoming you to a new episode of Jazz's Travel. This is a podcast series that explores jazz and creative music in all four corners of the globe, touching on cross-cultural projects, different music traditions and more through conversations with or about groundbreaking, innovative and visionary artists. Today's guest is trumpeter extraordinaire Gabriel Mark Hasselbach, the US-Canadian artist who has the rare distinction of regularly appearing simultaneously in the highest spots of mainstream and smooth jazz charts. Indeed, there are two sides of his personality showcased in two of his latest albums, the latest of which is a new installment in his dynamic mid-century modern series where he engages with jazz tradition with a modern twist. And the second finds him reasserting his reputation as an elite smooth jazz trumpet player on Tongan Groove, released in 2021. We talk about these projects and much more with Hasselbach in our latest episode of Jazz's Travel. So, without further ado, fire up an audio teeny and listen to the audio waves as they fly through the air. Here is our conversation with Gabriel Mark Hasselbach. Hello, Gabriel. Welcome to Jazz's Travel. Hey, Matt. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, and it's a pleasure to talk with you, Gabriel. So uh, I'm excited about our conversation. Gabriel, what part of the world are you speaking to us from right now? I'm in Vancouver, BC, Canada, the West Coast, just Uh above Seattle. Originally, you were born in Denver. That's where you were born. Denver, Colorado. That's right. I came up here when I was pretty young. Any uh, music-related early memories from your birthplace that uh, have kind of stayed with you? I was actually, I started performing live, uh, like sort of semi-professionally when I was 14. And, and I had my, actually had my first recording with a school concert band when I was eight. So that kind of got me playing. And I went into playing, uh, live shows and stuff with various bands when I was pretty young. Uh, and doing that in, in Colorado was okay, except the opportunities were very limited. It was mostly rock and country rock and that kind of stuff. So. I have, let's just say I have a, not a distaste isn't the right word, but I have a, I had a calling that wasn't in Colorado, put it that way. Right, right. And so why Vancouver? I originally was thinking about going to LA because that's where the music scene was. I had already been out there a few times, but I did recall how, uh, how much smog and traffic there was. And I, I knew that, uh, there was a pretty big hierarchy to, to plow through if you wanted to make a name for yourself. So I came to the quote unquote, uh, LA of Canada, which was Vancouver. And they was the Canadian Broadcasting Corp was was doing TV shows and radio shows and stuff out of here. And there was quite a bit of jazz going on. So I came up here and thought that would be the uh, path to follow. And and looking back on everything now, I'm glad I moved to Canada. I'll tell you. This series is called Jazz is Travel. So we also kind of like to find out about the jazz scenes or the music scenes of different parts of the world. Uh, how would you describe Vancouver, uh, its music scene? And uh, would you say that you are inspired by it in some way? Ooh, there's that's a double edged sword, too. Um, the right now, after since the pandemic was lifted and groups are allowed and, and then live music and stuff since like, like September, the live music scene has uh, gotten pretty lively again. Jazz here used to be fantastic. We used to, in years ago, we used to have several jazz clubs and, and even back in the, like the sixties, guys like Miles Davis and stuff would come through and play the clubs and it was like the Egress and the, uh, different, uh, the Nucleus and different jazz clubs that had name acts and everything. But that all went away in the late seventies, I think, or early eighties. Uh, now there's maybe, one or two jazz clubs and a couple of places that have jazz on a certain night. There's a lively music scene, but it's not exactly what I would call healthy. It's mm. just there, you know. Right, people aren't right. making people aren't making any money. That's for sure. Gabriel, talking about your your yeah. early musical experiences, which is something else that we really like to find out about on these podcasts and your formative years. Uh, when would you say you got bit by the jazz bug, and who were some of your early uh, musical heroes. Well, geez, when I was uh, really young, I would have would have been probably ten or eleven. I used to lie in my bed and at night under the covers when I was supposed to be asleep with this little seven transistor radio, AM AM radio, and and being in Colorado, you're right near the ionosphere, so I'd get reflections of of radio shows from St. Louis and New York and Chicago. 
and Philly. And those I could listen to those stations, the jazz stations at night, very clearly. And I got to listen to, uh, and I think I was probably most impressed by um, organ trios and, you know, Brother Jack Duff and and uh, trumpeters Lee Morgan and Clifford Brown and all those guys. That was the stuff, that was the early, early grounding for me. And then when I was a couple years older and I talked my mom into letting me join the Columbia Record Club, you know, you buy... One you buy you get the subscription and you get six free albums right so I my first album I got with them was Blue Note Jazz 1955 mm. and that had all the classic Clifford Brown stuff on it and Lee Morgan and uh, and and her and at the same same bundle I also got a her about uh, Brazil 66 and uh, another big band collection one so so jazz was pretty early on in my career and uh, early in my influence anyway. And I started playing in a jazz combo when I was 13 or 14. So. And, and the trumpet was the first instrument that you started playing. Yeah, that's right. I think back about how that started. And uh, to the best of my recollection, unless I'm just inventing this in my back of my brain somewhere, is I kind of rem- remember this image in my mind of watching TV uh, when I was about four or maybe five at the most. And there was a marching band on TV and trumpets going by with the little feathers in their marching band hats and i told my mom i wanted one of those that's i think that's how it started and then it was it was only you know three years later when i was actually starting to play in the school band and the very first year uh i was in the school band it was like at the time they had like summer band things they have all the elementary schools would combine had they had pretty good band programs back then and all the elementary schools would combine and make one big orchestra in the summer, like a summer activity or whatever. And and uh, we did a, a record that year. And it was, you know, one of those fundraiser ones where you go sell a record and get points to, or get, you get money to raise funds for a, a band tour or something like that. And, uh, yeah, that was that was when the die was cast. I, I, yeah. I liked that experience. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And now you play uh, uh, more instruments besides the trumpet. You play the flugelhorn, the flute, and so on, all of which are kind of part of the jazz tradition and some more attached to jazz tradition than others. But then you have also experimented with other uh, instruments, like I was uh, uh, reading electronic digital wind instruments too. I think this fact alone kind of speaks to the fact that there are two sides to your personality. One that draws on the jazz tradition, but then there's another one that also looks ahead and experiments with uh, modernity. Would that be fair to say? I think that's true. I mean, I've always been um, aware of the fact that jazz is an evolving art form to start with. I mean, we went back all the way from Scott Joplin, ragtime all the way through, swing all the way through, bebop all the way through, fusion all the way through, everything. And it's always been a growing, uh, a growing art form. And people bring different things to it. I mean, there was a period with the, you know, Return to Forever stuff where jazz was totally electric. Now it's probably swung the other way, gotten a lot more acoustic. But uh, back in the 80s, there was a guy named Niall Steiner who created this uh, electronic wind instrument. And they had a saxophone version and a trumpet version. Michael Brecker made the uh, saxophone one the most uh, prominent one. Niles was a trumpet player himself, so he, he recorded, you might have seen him in that big Barbara Streisand interview, or concert, and everybody was talking about this instrument and everything, and it's really an expressive instrument, and still, back from the 80s, I still play mine occasionally, and, and it's very expressive, it's not clunky at all, but you know, other companies have come along with uh, their sax versions, Yamaha, and uh, Roland, and, and Akai, and all these companies, so the the digital wave never has left us put it that yeah. way so and and also another fa- another sign of the fact that uh, uh speaking of your uh, the different sides to your musical and creative personality uh another sign uh, that you express them so successfully is that we should mention you are currently charting on both mainstream and smooth uh charts uh, there aren't very many artists who could say the same thing, uh, Gabriel. Uh, so I can't help but ask you, how does that feel? Uh, well, that was kind of a goal of mine because, uh, like I say, I've always felt jazz was an evolving kind of art form to start with. And to me, it's all just jazz. If you play it with passion and integrity and, and you're not trying to pander to uh, a certain kind of crowd, then it's all good 
good music. So, and I'm capable of doing both because I like both. I, you know, everything from, uh, I mean, I grew up also on Chuck Mangione and, and stuff as well as Chet Baker. So to me, it's all kind of melts into one thing. And my goal here was to kind of, you know, there's a whole sea of players out there and, uh, trying to get noticed is, is kind of a hard thing sometimes. But I figured if I was doing something that nobody else was able to do, that might get me some attention. You know, here we are and doing a podcast. So maybe that's proof in the pudding. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't play one style or the other just because I'm trying to, um, show off. It's because I like both styles of music and grew up on both styles of music. One of your uh, recent projects, and I think a fascinating one at that, is your mid-century modern series, uh, which has uh, reached its third uh, volume. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the concept of this series and the origins of this concept? I have, in my lifetime, have mostly released contemporary jazz. Some people call it smooth jazz, but uh, smooth jazz actually is a little bit... Uh, derogatory in some ways because it sounds like you're trying to iron out the wrinkles totally which Mm. is not my thought but uh, i'll call it contemporary jazz for the sake of this and most of my albums have been like that and i had i think uh nine ten billboard hits with my projects i have like 14 albums out 10 board or nine billboard hits with my contemporary stuff and then a couple years ago i knew that i had uh, more to say, so to speak, in the marketplace. I mean, I've been been working out in New Orleans too, so I have a strong New Orleans co- connection and uh, uh, a skill in that idiom that just goes back pretty far too. So, uh, my first volume included some New Orleans stuff and some straight ahead stuff and a few, you know, funkier interpretations of straight ahead stuff. Second volume got even more straight ahead. Uh, longer solos. I had Ernie Watts and some some well-known straight-ahead jazzers on it. Uh, and that got even a little more mainstream. And then mid, uh, Mid-Century Modern Volume 3 was just sort of an all-out, unabashed, play it straight. I actually decided that to uh, bring forth that organ trio stuff, that organ combo stuff that I was listening to when I was young. So I've got a fantastic organist on there, and we we did a original tune Randy Brecker gave me to record, so he, that's on there. Uh, and so the first first three tunes, anyway, are organ trio tunes, quartet tunes, and um, brought that forward. And then the rest of the stuff is just my interpretation of really great, timeless jazz pieces. And again, jazz. different instruments too, right? Right. I, I do look at my music, uh, at least what I do, not just my music, but what I have to say as being more based on color and texture than on notes and theory. Because I know there's a lot of players out there that, that they play for other musicians and they just play as many notes as they can and see how they can string it together and how cute it can be. And it's kind of a wanking process to a large degree. To me, I always want to play for listeners, uh, give them something with content, with some, some meat to it and, and not disappoint them musically. But doing that, part of that, it, to me, is combining my flute and my other horns, my trumpet, my flugelhorn, mutes. I use a lot of mutes in my horns. Uh, I use my uh, iwi, my electronic wind instrument in there, and create palette, a palette of sounds that helps bring forth these tunes that I consider classics. I yeah, just like yeah. that whole spectrum of stuff. You mentioned working out of uh, New Orleans, and I-, I wanted to ask you a bit more about that. Well, I've been playing uh, down in New Orleans since about 1998. I've always uh, appreciated the New Orleans sound. I've never, I've, I'm skilled in playing the, what they call Dixieland music, but that's not what really appeals to me as much as sort of the uh, bluesier New Orleans stuff and Wynton Marsalis type of stuff. So uh, I've been playing there since 1998. I have a, a a house down there and I uh, go down as much as I can. Uh, last few years I haven't been able to do much, but I play down there. I play all the little uh, clubs and halls like Snug Harbor and Spotted Cat and places like that and play with a variety of musicians down there. Uh, some traditional, some edgy, some future future thinking, forward thinking. It's That is a, a part of my musical expression that I couldn't deny and I don't do it just to be... Uh, um, 
clever. Well, first of all, I'd like to ask you if this if you see this series continuing. Well, I think so. Uh, I I didn't think Volume Three would come around, and yet it did. So uh-huh. we'll see. Every time every time I do an album, I, I go like, oh, this is probably going to be my last one. I'm this is just yeah. wearing me out, or or the the industry isn't going to support it, or the market isn't going to support it, or I can't afford it, or whatever. And then something comes up again. So right now I'm up to I'm up to like. Uh, 11 Billboard hits and had an Album of the Year award, Instrumentalist of the Year award, and uh, West Coast Music Award, and some few different things. So every time I keep putting something out, it gets a little more traction, and then it comes back to uh, deliver at some point. Well, well, the reason why I was asking that, of course, is because uh, the first volume was released, I think, in 2018. And since then, you have kind of alternated. Uh, you've released one of your mid-century modern, but then you also released an album that sounds different. And we have talked about how you like to do that. You like to kind of, uh, you, you know, express yourself in different ways. And the latest of these albums I also wanted to talk about on this podcast. It's called Tongue and Groove. And first off, you know, again, I have to ask you about the title of this record. Is there a meaning behind it? Oh, now there is a point of me trying to be clever. Uh, well, <laughs> if, if you do any know anything about woodworking, you know how what tongue and groove is, right? Where the the two pieces have kind of jigsaw puzzle ends, two pieces of wood, and you put them together, the tongue and the groove, and they interlock. So uh-huh. there's that. But don't don't uh, forget that when you're playing a trumpet, you're doing a lot of tonguing, and I got a lot of groove on this album. So yeah. Well, another thing about this album is that it's joyful to me when I was listening to it. That's kind of what I heard was a lot of joy. That's interesting to me because in the times that we're living in and with all that we've been through in recent times, for an album like this to come out in uh, 2021, which is when it was officially released, it's quite refreshing to hear an album like this. Oh, that's nice of you to say. I mean, there is a lot of joy in making music. And actually, that mu- that album was made during the pandemic. So I had this is one of the first times when I was able to make an album and not feel any pressure to have it out at a certain time because I didn't even know if it would come out, and I wasn't distracted by playing live gigs and touring and doing what have you and trying to squeeze it in. So I had time to spend and just kind of mull it over. And I, I, I it reminded me of uh, these guys that chip away at at a marble statue and they just go chip 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 chip. So I created something that felt good. I mean, during the pandemic, it was it was a rough time for a lot of people, and I didn't have to suffer too much. And I had a nice little enclave here in my own studio, so I just got to dig in, you know. And that gave me joy right there because I was sort of uh, bypassing all the trauma that was going on. On this record, we also hear some great musicians, uh, you know, Chris Standring and uh, uh, Bob Baldwin. Uh, can you tell me a bit about uh, how you worked with them on this record, considering as well that you, you said that you kind of worked on this album during the pandemic. Uh, were there any challenges to overcome there? Uh, slow internet speed, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right. About, you know, it was all done pretty much virtually. I did a few things oh. live, but... Uh, it mostly done. I, you know, I'd send them tracks. I wrote a lot of songs with Bob Baldwin in the past, and uh, we did that all virtually. And uh, actually, the first single off of there that got it was my eleventh Billboard hit, "Chill at Will." That was co-wrote uh, over the internet, and then that sat actually for quite a while. And then I came back and kind of polished it up, and Bob added some stuff, and it was voila, it was done. Uh, so you did engage in kind of recording remotely, uh, which was oh, something yeah. that a lot oh, of yeah. people discovered during those times. How do you find that process? I, I quite like it. Um, there's a lot of pressure when you go into a studio and uh, you have to deliver the, the perfect solo or something right then and there in front of everybody. Time is money. You got musicians standing there and you got all that stuff. But if you if you got your own your own space, you can record something and go... Mm, I can do better. You listen to it a few times. You go, maybe I'll just punch in that, fix that one note or whatever. Because I don't like putting stuff out there that's got loose threads, if you know what I mean. So Mm -hmm. it gives you the chance to be a little more perfect with what you do. Well, uh, Gabriel, uh, I'd like to just ask you, maybe conclude this podcast interview by just asking you, what's next for you? Uh, Will you be uh, on the going on the road, and are you working on anything that you'd like to share with us? Uh, well, yes, I've, I've had some offers to go do some shows in the States, but, um, 
I've had to decline so far just because um, there's still vaccination border. I'm I'm not an anti-vaxxer because I I'm vaccinated, but there's still these these mask and vaccine issues at the border on the Canadian border and coming into the U.S. And there's uh, uh, I'm not exactly thrilled about getting stuck in an air, airport for four hours and then getting stuck on a plane for another four or five hours with bunch of yahoos so i mean i'm not in any eager you know space to be doing that and i have a a nice little uh steady once a week gig here in vancouver which is a uh not only a great performance ground but also just loose enough to be a good uh training ground for bringing out a new material and trying out new stuff so i'm you know i got two little dogs and a great wife and a nice place i'm living so you know, all of it is, I'm not that eager to get out back out on the road and hit the, uh, I did five years solid at one point and it's like, okay, I've done this now. Well, where, where is it that people can uh, see you in Vancouver? We may have some listeners from there. That's right. Um, there's a place here in Burnaby called the Admiral Pub and Grill. Really nice showroom. It's, it's not really a pub sort of, I guess, but, uh, it's a, it's a showroom. I've got a nice stage and a big room, great sound system. And I'm there every Sunday, five to eight make it kind of early because they've got a great menu it's not pub food so people come and have dinner and stuff and then uh night times they have uh, other on the weekends and stuff they have just regular sort of dance bands and stuff but i i own the sundays there so that's pretty cool and we have guests sometimes we bring special guests up uh-huh right i have a right, full right. i have a full band there with regular guys all right gabriel well it's been a pleasure chatting with you uh thank you very much for joining us on jazz is travel well thanks for having me I hope you enjoyed our Jazz Is Travel conversation with Gabriel Mark Hasselbach as music from Mid-Century Modern Volume 3 plays us out. I encourage you to check out that album, the other albums in this dynamic series, and also Tongue and Groove. And I also encourage you to join me again next week for a new episode of Jazz Is Travel. And in the meantime, don't forget to check out jazzis.com, our regularly updated website with lots of great content on jazz and beyond. And you get access to even more great exclusive content when you subscribe. Till the next time, this is Matt McCutchie signing off. See you soon.